go through are the Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Welcome, everyone. Margaret, are you a new person or I'm just not recognizing your email address or your Zoom name? Margaret, can you unmute and let me know? Are you a new person that I'm welcoming today? Sorry, it's Lizzie. Uh -huh. okay. I share this Hi, with my uh, boss. Welcome back. <laughs> Welcome back. Okay. Thank so, you so much. I really love your class. The feeling's mutual. You're amazing teacher and artist. <laughs> I'm serious. It's really been well, very helpful. Mm. I, I, at this stage of my life, I don't seem to blush anymore. So I'm metaphorically blushing. Thank you so much. <laughs> it is my great pleasure. That's a great segue for me to say. It is my great pleasure to be here with you all and to welcome you all to our final April Art at Home. Major mega thank you as always to the Hoboken Public Library for hosting Art at Home and allowing us to do art from a distance safely during the continuing COVID pandemic. April is National Poetry Month, and we have been looking at and studying artists who have been inspired by or who have themselves written poetry and done visual art alongside poetry. Today, our artist is one of the great European old masters. I tend to think of him though, as one of the underappreciated great Renaissance masters. His name is Titian. Titian is probably the greatest Venetian Renaissance painter who ever lived. I can probably imagine, I'm not hearing because you're all muted, but I can imagine the gasps of shock and horror because we've all, including us who've been to art school, have been brought up to believe, indoctrinated to believe that Leonardo and Michelangelo were the greatest Renaissance painters who ever lived. But I would argue that Titian was the master of them all. He's been overlooked, I believe, because of the extraordinary skill that Michelangelo had as a sculptor. And da Vinci ascended to the height because of a lot of the stories and historical information that we have about da Vinci's life, some of which is mythological uh, in proportion. Not to say they weren't great painters in their own right, but Titian to me, and maybe because he focused on painting and painting alone, reached the heights of Renaissance skill and artistry. Of course, Michelangelo and da Vinci were distracted by other things. Michelangelo with his sculpting and architecture, da Vinci with his interests in science and writing. And they were all masters in their own time, don't get me wrong, but Titian to me was the greatest painter, Renaissance Italian painter, particularly from the Venetian school. He was born in, they think, possibly 1488, anywhere between 1488 and 1490. And my Italian is pretty awful, so I'm going to butcher his full name. Forgive me, those of you who are 
Italian speakers or of Italian ancestry. His full name is Tiziano Vicelio or Tiziano Vicelli. He was born in Pieva di Cadore in the Republic of Venice. He died August 27th, 1576 in Venice. He was recognized even in his own lifetime at a very young age as an extraordinarily gifted painter. And his reputation never waned. Even in the long life that he had, he always maintained this reputation for extraordinarily or extraordinary excellence in the skill that he had. And here's a quote from the art theorist Giovanni Lamazzo, who declared him the sun amidst small stars, not only among the Italians, but all the painters of the world. So his genius is not questioned today. He was great in all aspects of the painter's art. He was a portraitist. He did religious art. He also was fascinated by mythology, particularly Greek and Roman mythology. In fact, that was probably, well, I'm about to say something that I'm not sure is quite true, but probably Greek and Roman mythology was most of the mythology that he was even aware of during his lifetime. I'm not sure, maybe they knew about Egyptian myth. I'm not sure, they should have. Um, and he was famous in his portraiture. He was famous for the fact that he could portray the, the true character of the people that he was trying to show. So he was excellent, not only at showing their faces realistically, but he wasn't shy about showing the nature of their character. For example, he was living during a time when there was a lot of Machiavellian machinations in the Italian world. And he didn't shy away from showing if a person had an evil character, he would let that show through in the portraits that he did. In his religious paintings, he would um, show the true quality of a young Madonna. He, if she was young, in her early years, he would show her as youthful and beautiful. He wouldn't, as many of the painters of that time would, he would not show her as an old craggy figure. He would show her truly as a young Madonna. And he would show the tragic depths of the crucifixion. So his figures of Jesus often looked as tortured as Jesus probably felt. He didn't hide the reality of the figures that he was portraying. All right. So he left home at a very young age, at the age of nine. He left his tiny village in the Alps in Italy and he traveled to Venice with a brother and he became the apprentice first of an artist named Sebastiano Zucato, who was a mosaic master. And then he was soon passed on. I guess that's what happened. Children were passed around the workshops. He was passed on to the workshop of the Bellinis. Giovanni Bellini, at that time was the greatest Venetian painter of the day. So Titian kind of lucked out and became the apprentice of this extraordinary Venetian painter. And for a while, it was difficult to figure out whose paintings were done by which artists. 
Titian was very much influenced by Bellini and for several years, uh, you could not tell them apart. And that became true later on when he became the apprentice of another great Renaissance artist, Giorgione. And it was virtually impossible to separate Titian's work from Giorgione. But later in life, it became truly evident whose art was which. Titian became very famous for the red haired women. You can still hear today, Margo, I'm looking at your uh, photograph that you have for your Zoom image. You have Titian hair. And Titian frequently painted the women in his portraits or in his religious and mythological paintings with the most gorgeous red hair. And he became famous for that. Okay. So much to say about him, but we really don't have a whole lot of time to do that. A quick question. Sure, Jane. I love Thank questions. You. So given, well, I'll, you know, reveal my ignorance, but I, I have not heard of him. Maybe I will recognize the paintings, but could you, given what you've said about his, his incredible artistry, could you uh, say that he, did he have an influence on artists oh that followed him? Did he have an influence on artists who came after him? Is that what yeah, you're Yeah, yeah. Like what was his mark on, aside from his abilities, what mark did he leave on, on the art world? He had a tremendous influence on artists who followed him. I mean, name an artist and I'll say yes. Titian had a huge influence. So, yeah. I mean, he was extraordinary. Well, I'm looking forward to see now. <laughs> okay, good, good. I even have in my notes, I'm, I'm frantically searching. I do have a list of all the artists he influenced, but I haven't found it yet. But name any major artists, including up till now in the 2020s, and I'll probably be able to give you a direct line back to t -shirt. He was a huge influence, particularly on portrait painters. So yes, the answer to that is yes. So a little bit about his life. In the 1520s, the early 1520s, Titian brought home a woman um, from Kadari, his hometown, named Cecilia. They had two sons in 1524. Um, the first became a priest and the second, Orazio, became a painter and he was Titian's chief assistant um, throughout his life. And um, Cecilia also gave birth to two daughters after a severe illness, one of whom died in infancy. Cecilia died in 1530. Titian never recovered from his grief over her death and never remarried. All right. I'm about ready to look at some of his paintings, but let me see if I can find that list of artists directly influenced by Titian. Definitely Donatello, Raphael, those are names you recognize, I hope, Jane. Late oh, Renaissance yes. painters. Yes. And one thing also to mention about Titian was he was hired by many of the leading politicians and uh, dukes and popes of the time of his life. And this is why the subject matter of his paintings change frequently because of the contracts that he had with these folks. 
Yeah, I'm not finding the list, Jane, sorry. No worries. It's kind of interesting to me that, you know, at that time, wealth was uh, concentrated in this, you know, class of society. And so art was influenced in such a different way than it is now. Well, is it? I don't know. I mean, you know, if you think about how many, well, I, I don't know. I mean, I'm, I'm just thinking out loud, so. The patrons of the arts back in the day were the wealthy. It's very similar, I believe, to the way it is today. So art has become, it's become a product that is sold primarily to people with large amounts of money including these NFTs now, non-fungible tokens have become astronomically expensive in a short period of time. Most art has become unaffordable. Most of what we call great art is out of reach to the everyday person. Um, so to me, it, it's not that much different uh, than the Renaissance times. Also, Liz, can I point out something? It's Fran. Hi, Fran. Uh, the impression that I get is also that who decides what is art and what is worthy or not, it's also the wealthy. So. Yes. So a lot of times the tastemakers of our societies are the people with the money. Not always, but frequently that is the case. Particularly, let's put it this way, particularly in Western civilization. That is the case. So some of the patrons of Titian were people like Philip II of Spain, um, Pope Paul III, or second, I'm not sure now. I think it was the third. Yeah, still not finding that list, Jane. I'm gonna keep looking. It may be in my information about the one painting that I want us to spend particular attention to. And I'm gonna talk about that in a moment. But first let's talk about his death. Titian died of old age in 1576 when a plague was unfortunately raging in Venice. And he is now interred in the church of Santa Maria de Frari, where two of his most famous works can also be seen. He was highly successful in all branches of the painter's art throughout his long life. The painting that we are going to look at first and spend quite a bit of time looking at and talking about is, and I hope I'm pronouncing this correctly, is the Dane. And I want to look at this painting first because it is inspired by and based on a painting, uh, a poem by Ovid called The Metamorphosis. And The Metamorphosis is from the ancient Greek myths it's built upon the stories of the ancient Greek, Greek myths. And the story of Danai, let's, let's bring the image up first and then I'll talk about the myth. So let me open up this picture. We have to minimize. And there are six versions of this picture. Um, this is not, I don't think I have the original version. No, I do not. The one I'm gonna show you is not the original. And I'm gonna explain why momentarily. I couldn't find the original. Lauren, if you are up to it, maybe when I explain to you what the original looks like, maybe you can find it. I'm on it. My pleasure. 
And then I'm not sure how I can share it, but we'll, we'll try. I can find a link for the metamorphosis, you said? It's called the Dane, which is spelled Dane, okay. D A N A E. Dane and the Shower of Gold. Oh, and I should have said before opening it too late, but there is some nudity. I hope this does not offend folks, but the Renaissance artist loved the human figure. And here we have the very nude, very voluptuous figure of Dane. So here's the myth that was in the poem, Metamorphosis. The ancient Greek myth goes, this is the short abbreviated version. So the story of Dane is about a young woman the, she was the daughter of a king and he went to an oracle or a, I forget, a future, you know, somebody who could tell the future. His name was Acrisius, an oracle, yes. He went to an oracle to find out if he was ever gonna have any male children. And this oracle told him that he wouldn't have male children, but his daughter would, and one of them would kill him. Well, Acrisius was, of course, understandably horrified by this story, by this fate. And the legend goes that he locked poor Dane up, and it can go two ways. One, in a tall tower, or two, in a dungeon. And there was no light, she could see, no window, she could not see in or out. But Chryseis didn't want her to be tempted by seeing any gorgeous young men walking past her window who would, you know, tempt her into mating and having children. However, what happened was Zeus somehow caught a glimpse of her and immediately started lusting after her. And the way he got around her father's um, imprisonment of her, Zeus transformed himself into a shower of gold. And some interpretations of the myths say it was a shower of gold coins. And he descended upon her and had relations with her and impregnated her. And she did have a male child named Perseus. And Perseus did eventually slaughter Acrisius. And the Oracle's story, the Oracle's uh, foretelling came true. So this is not the first version, the original version of Titian's painting, which was um, ordered by King Philip II of Spain. The original was, or no, was the original King Philip of Spain? Let me see if I can find that out. I don't think I have that right. There were six different versions. Philip II got one of them. This one, I know Philip II got this one with the old crag and in the corner. The original version has a Cupid where the old woman is. And Titian loved the old woman image way more than the Cupid so much that he did it in the five versions after, or the four versions after. I'll keep looking. I can't find that information all of a sudden about who got the original.
I'm not sure it's important. But the original did have a Cupid rather than this old woman. This is, however, very emblematic of Titian's style and work. The very luscious, rounded, nude figure. She's a little bit erotic, although compared to artists who came after, she's still kind of controlled. Um, she's definitely aware of the fact that Zeus is there. She doesn't look frightened or worried. She looks a little bit awestruck definitely not warding him off or pushing him away as if she probably even had a choice. But um, the expression on her face is very characteristic of the kinds of things that Titian strove to do. He wanted his people, his portraits to look real to show emotion and feeling. Gorgeous skin tone. He worked at trying to create the most realistic colors that he could. What else can we say? Obviously the composition, the focal point is the figure of Dane. He's highlighted her by highlighting her. You know, he's made her the focal point by highlighting her with this light. The mystery is where is this light coming from? Because in the myth, she had no window in her chamber. Um, some people say Titian ignored that part of the myth and that there was light entering her room from somewhere. So that is up to debate. Art historians debate that constantly. Where is the light coming from? Also the expression on the old woman, her nurse's face is quite wonderful as well. She kind of looks joyful to me, almost ecstatic. She looks orgasmic, in fact, way more than Dane, and she's holding her apron out to catch the golden coins as they descend. And there's some reference to prostitution, historians think, because gold coins were what prostitutes were paid. The gold coin was, was what prostitutes were paid in, in those days. But isn't, she's just so beautiful. Liz, from an yeah. art history point of view, this reminds me of Manet's, even though it's different, Olympia yeah. very much. I mean, yeah. there's so, something about the composition and even though it's totally different and even, you know, Matisse playing with blue nudes and everything, it, it, the idea of the whole composition. And you can believe that those artists look <laughs> yeah. So here, Jane, is the answer to your question, did Titian influence other artists? Yes, indeed. He certainly did. There is a direct line between Titian and many great artists who followed. Look at this absolute beautiful dark negative space under Danae's back, under the small of her back. Love, love, love that. Really beautiful. There is to me a very lyrical poetic feel to this piece. Remember he was influenced by the poetry of Ovid, even though this was a commission, he was asked to do this piece. There is evidence that he read the poem and that he was highly influenced by it. All right, let's look at some other 
I want to look at one of his famous religious works next. Why am I not remembering how to exit from this? Here we go. Stop share. Okay, so here's one of his more famous religious paintings. This is an early work. So you can see at a very young age, he just had some of the most amazing skill sets. This is the Annunciation of Mary. She's being visited by God who's letting her know that she is going to be impregnated with Jesus. Look at the expression on her face. Definite sense of awe and fear, I think. power of God is obvious in the way her clothing is being whipped about, the movement of the clouds at her feet and behind her, her arms raised in fear and supplication, the gorgeous movement of her fingers. I mean, she's definitely vulnerable, right? <laughs> she's, even though she's in a position of energy and power, you can tell that she's the vulnerable person here. And this, I should note though, that as Annunciation imagery went back in the day, this Annunciation is unusual in the fact that Mary is thrust up through the center. Usually Mary is knelt in prayer and supplication. So Titian's um, positioning of her in the center of the composition is unusual for a Renaissance portrayal. I love that about this painting. Look at the, the really beautiful way he's worked with the shading and the folds of the fabric. These are the kinds of things that he was quite famous for. So the, the beautiful anatomy of the, the putti, that's the Italian word, I guess, for cupids. The beautiful little, I mean, it's, it's very accurate for the anatomy of a baby, the very ram belly, the fat chubby thighs, the kind of large head of a baby. It's just wonderful. Then it's such exciting composition that you only see the arm of this, baby extended outwards. That's genius. And then the, the, the putti down here supporting the clouds that are holding up Mary. It's quite wonderful. And a note about color. In Renaissance times, Mary was always clothed in blue or purple. That was her color. And I think I, I'm guessing about this, but I think the red is color of Annunciation. Those of you who are Catholic may be able to clarify that if anyone in the Zoom is Catholic. Um, I taught in Catholic school for so long. I think that's where I'm getting that idea from, that red is the color of enunciation. But I don't quote me on that one. 
I love that the sky behind her is almost empty. That really creates such a powerful outline of the upper part of her body and makes us really, it forces us to focus on her face and arms and the whole dynamic of her figure along with this very wonderful diagonal line of the blue drape. It's just a fabulous painting. And again, this was early in his career. He was quite young. I don't know his exact age, but. The guy could paint. Okay, so let's look at one of his portraits. I can find one. I think this is one of the popes. So portraits at this time were not just a sign of wealth, but they were an emblem of power. And the cardinals, the popes, they all needed to have these portraits to wield. They were an emblem of power. It was a way they could show their extreme power. I think that this is Paul III. Um, it's, it's called Paul Without the Cap. And look at the just absolute fantastic rendering of the face. Now, he also flattered the people he painted. He didn't always make it photographically realistic. He knew where his money was coming from. And also these people were so extraordinarily powerful, he couldn't afford to insult them. So he would often soften a hard jaw or shorten a bulbous nose, but he still was faithful, as faithful to realism as he could be without insulting. Look at the gorgeous hands, right? Just Magnificent. Laura, you have a question. Yeah, I wonder what book he's reading. Well, one would assume <laughs> the Bible, but who knows? It could be Machiavelli he's reading. <laughs> <laughs> and here's an interesting side note. The, um, it wasn't the Pope, but one of the cardinals never paid Titian. And Titian left Venice for a while because he was so cranky about the fact that he was not paid. And he moved to Germany, Augsburg, Germany and lived there for quite a while. Um, and uh, did very well in his stay in Germany and then returned to Venice to live out his old age. But yeah, these guys, they were wealthy, but they were, nasty and evil. <laughs> yeah, Machiavellian. The, the term really came of age during the time of the Renaissance. They read the book and they followed it well. All right. So obviously Titian was a realist and figurative. Oh, Lauren, did you, you found the original? So everyone, if you like, follow the link and you will see that the old woman is not in the original painting. It is um, a little Cupid. Yeah, and I don't know if this is the was the intention, but actually the negative space that you talked about uh -huh. is um, is not in that in it's that not version. Either. The negative space behind her back. 
Yeah, it's um, it's shown as folds of cloth underneath her. Which do you like better? That's always my question. <laughs> I well, I I saw a lot more detail uh, on on the uh, on that version, but I would have to really compare them, spend some time on it. Yeah. Sure, which is why we're not going to look at both today. The interesting fact is that Titian liked the second better. He liked the version with the old woman better. Would that we could sit down and chat with him, but we can't. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah, thanks. For yeah, all of the versions, the four versions that came after the Dane with the old woman had the old woman in it. He liked that version better. And so would you say he then just went ahead and um, painted again and again this theme? Or yes. was this? No, he painted, yeah. he painted the Danai six times. Okay. He loved it. Yeah. He loved it. And they weren't all commissions. The first two, I know for a fact, were commissions. He did them because he was paid to do them. Um, but he was fascinated by this story. Who wouldn't be? It's just a beautiful story. Okay. Figurative, realistic. Here's my challenge to all of you today. You are not Titian. You are not Michelangelo, you are not Leonardo. However, all of you who are on this Zoom today have done figurative work with me before. You know that we can measure the figure by head length. Uh, I have not even opened the diagram that I usually show, but raise your hand if you would like me to put that up today. Do the thing in the reaction bar at the bottom of your Zoom screen, please raise your hand if you'd like me to open up the proportions of the human body. <clears throat> Great, I'm gonna do it. While I'm looking for that, because I haven't opened it yet today, here's what I would like you to do. If you are just beginning learning how to draw the human figure, our assignment today, by the way, will be to draw a figure as realistically as possible. And if you are new at doing this, and we are all coming in at different levels, and that's cool and awesome. I'm here to help you no matter what your level. If you're a newbie though, all you need today is a number two pencil or any drawing equipment and paper that you feel comfortable with. So I want you to start hunting for a number two pencil, get yourself a good big eraser. Everybody will need an eraser and pull all your materials together. Find a photograph of someone in motion, either a dancer or an athlete. You can Google and find something try and find a figure that is large. I recommend that you not work from a family photo because the image of the figure will be tiny. You want to work from something big. So look on Google and see if you can either print out or put on the screen for yourself a large image of someone in motion. Everyone else, I want you to do the same thing but you can gather any materials that you want to use today. If you feel ready to experiment with paint or pastels, gather up all the stuff that you need, find yourself a photograph to work from and go to work. And for those of you who are needing a refresher or a tutorial in the human figure, I'm going to get that all set up for you right now. Just give me a minute. Any questions? And you can ask questions verbally now because I'm now busy looking 
Liz, I think Lauren had her hand up. Yes, I'm looking for her and others for the proportions of the human figure. Great, thanks. You're welcome. I have a folder for that. I'm just looking for it and I'm gonna pull up that image in just a minute. which for some reason, hang in there, everybody. Here we go. Oops, shy for some reason. Here we go. So for those of you who need a refresher, I'm going to share the screen now, and we're going to talk about, I am delighted and happy to talk about, oh, it's not there. Bear with me. Try again. Magic of technology. Here we go. The proportions of the human figure. Everybody I hope can see this. Those of you who don't need this tutorial now, just please start doing your work. So the human figure can be measured in head lengths both vertically and horizontally. But the most important to remember it, thing to remember first is that the human figure is symmetrical. If I was really a horrible masochistic evil monster and I took a chainsaw and I cut this body down the middle, outwardly, the visible portion of the body, if I cut it in half, it would be the same on both sides. Now, to get the proportion correct, I could measure head lengths down the body. And the male and female proportions are vertically pretty much the same. That's because the head size on any given figure is different. So let's count the male figure first. Let's count downwards from the top. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight head lengths is the average male figure. And the female, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight head lengths. Horizontally across the shoulders, you can also use head lengths, but you can see it's slightly different because the heads are turned on the side in the shoulder area. But it is one, two, three head lengths wide in the shoulder area. And this is 
a part of the human body that people frequently overlook or mistakenly do too small. Our shoulders and even I'm kind of a small person in the shoulder area. We tend to shortchange people in the shoulder width. Even I have shoulders that are wider than most people might ordinarily observe. So don't forget to check out the width of the shoulders in the figure that you're looking at. Another area that artists tend to overlook, particularly artists who are new to drawing the human figure is the neck. Don't forget the neck. It's really an important part of the body. Draw it. Now, the next thing to think about is the torso. It's way longer than we actually think. From the neck, from the chin to the waist, one, two, almost three head lengths down. It's really about two and a half head lengths to the waist. Down to the groin area is three head lengths. To the hips is three head lengths. And the next thing I like to point out to people is the arm length. Look how long the arms are. This is an area that people always get wrong in the beginning. Our arms are very, very long. So from the shoulder to the tips of the finger, one, two, three, four head lengths. Our arms are long. And now on to the legs from the hip, one, two, three, four head lengths to the tip of the toes. So again, as I said, don't shortchange the shoulder width, don't shortchange the length of the arms and legs. They are, those are important things to notice. All right, any questions? Good. So I am going to do a demo for those of you who need to watch, um, feel free. I prefer that you plunge in, do your own thing. The best way to learn, particularly in something like the human figure that we all tend, including myself, and I've been doing art since I'm seven years old, yikes, it's a lifetime ago, we tend to clutch up. And that is because we think about the parts of the human body and we think, oh, I can't draw hands, I can't draw faces, I can't draw whatever. But the best way to learn how to do it and overcome those inhibitions is to just jump in and do it. And the more you do it, the looser you will get and the better you will get at it. So you can watch me if you like, if you think it's gonna help you or what I would prefer is you just go ahead and do your own thing. Those of you who are working in color today, I would encourage you to think about Titian's palette. Um, try and stay natural. Use pastels or if you use acrylics, stay in a more neutral earth tone palette or if you're working in oils, whatever color media you're working with, I wouldn't go bright unless that's the mood you're in today. All right, let's go for it. We will stop at 1145 as usual for sharing. And I will be starting to talk to you about May. Hard to believe, but we're heading into a new month. And May is Asian American and Pacific Islander History Month. One of my favorites. So many great artists to celebrate in May. I can't decide. I have been commissioned to do a portrait of my great nephew. 
I probably have mentioned this already. I've been avoiding doing it. I hate these kinds of commissions. Never accept commissions to do family portraits. That's my advice. They create a lot of anxiety. I'm adjusting my easel. set up for horizontal work and I want to work vertical today. Easel is set up. So I'm going to start first in pencil, and then if I have time, I think I'm going to work in soft pastel today. I find that soft pastel uh, is perfect for portraiture, particularly when I'm doing skin tone color. Titian, by the way, worked in oils. Oils and egg tempera. And fresco. So I'm looking at a picture of my young grandnephew. He is awfully cute. So how old is he? Um, good question. <laughs> well, like a baby or? Oh, no. He's, um, I think he's about seven now. Oh, yeah. Cute. He is very cute. 
So are the proportions different for a child? Ah, good question. Excellent question. Yes, children have very large heads. Their heads are still developing. The brain is still developing and the skull is closing. By the time a child is seven, though, it's pretty much fairly um, well developed and is much more in line with adult proportion. But still, the head is a little bit larger. The forehead is still bigger in a child than it would be in an adult. Mm. So the, the differences are more, as the child is growing up, are more facial than they mm. are um, in the rest of the anatomy. Of course, a child's body is smaller than an adult's, but it's still in the same proportional range. So the head lengths are still the same. Mm. So the relationships are still, the head is slightly larger. So the, the head lengths may be a little fewer, but not real, not by much. Mm. So instead of eight, it might be seven and a half that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. But facially, the differences are large. Doing the gestural drawing, keeping my pencil loose, and I'm holding it near the eraser end, not clutching near the tip. I'm just trying to capture the movement of his pose, the posture that his body's in, just trying to figure out where his shoulders are in relation to his ears, for example, those kinds of relationships, where are his elbows in relationship to his waist and his chest, where, is, where are his hands in relationship to his hips and waist and knees, working out my composition.
So when you do a commission portrait, do you do a lot of pre-work sketches? I don't know what you call it. It usually takes me three tries to get it right. And it's drawing first. What? Using a pencil first? Sometimes I'll do an entire watercolor or whatever they ask me to do it in. Sometimes mm -hmm. I'll do an entire thing and rip it up and start all over again. Sometimes I'll rip it up at the pencil sketch stage. It depends how satisfied I am at any stage of the game. So there's, I don't have a prescribed method, if that's what you're asking, no. Yeah, yeah, I didn't know if there was a structure. <laughs> And I, my guess is every artist is different on that. I mean, some artists are so practiced at portraiture, they do it for a living and they get it right the very first time. Mm. And then there, I love the artists who do the quick portraits and caricatures on the street. They have a lot of tricks that they have learned over the years to enable them to capture their subjects quickly and accurately. It's all about practice and repeat doing it over and over and over again. It really depends on the artist's style. We've studied artists who do millions of copies before they're satisfied. And then other artists, as I said, who get it right the very first time. And by right, it's, you know, what I decide is right. All right, I'm gonna excuse myself, everyone, for a quick run to the ladies. I shall return.
Okay, how are we doing? Please, at any time, if you're having difficulties, let me know. Or if you need advice. This is, for me, the real disadvantage of Zoom teaching. When we're in person, I can walk around and see what you're doing and offer advice. No one seems to be struggling, so that's good. All right, so I'm going to go back to work on my image. And I am now going to start on the face of my grandnephew. And this, see, this is the disadvantage of a family photo. The facial features are so tiny that I'm struggling to actually see his face. That's why I said I don't recommend doing a family photo. Liz, why don't you blow it up? Um, do you have a printer? I do, but I'm not going to do it now. But that is a good idea. I just put the light on for my benefit. But there is glare on my paper. If that's not good for folks, just let me know. Thanks for the suggestion, Susan. So again, very lightly in pencil now. I want to be able to erase. I know I'm going to make mistakes. It's OK. So if I work lightly in pencil, I'll have that ability to erase and erase easily. Those of you who are more experienced and feeling confident, if you want to use non-erasable material, go for it. If you like using Sharpie or graphite. Have at it. Working in paint, do it. Now, the way to work with proportions is the, in the human face is to measure by eye length. And I'm actually literally doing it with my fingers. I drew an eye. Now, everything else in the face, I can measure by eye length. So the length of the nose from the bridge to the tip is one eye length long. And I did that pretty accurately, if I do say so myself. The space between the eyes, the bridge of the nose, is one eye length. The more you draw, the more readily you'll start seeing that, the less you will have to do the actual measuring. But until you're more experienced, there's nothing wrong with measuring. But eventually, your eye will become trained to do it without the measuring. And just like with anything, practice makes perfect.
So I always have trouble with where to put the mouth. So is that a measurement? The mouth is halfway between the tip of the nose and the chin. And when you say mouth, you mean like the line of the mouth? You know, like as opposed to the top lip, bottom lip? Right. Mm. The line between the upper and lower lip is halfway between the bottom of the nose and the bottom of the chin. Does that help? Mm -hmm. You can look at me. Mm. Okay. Mm. Amazing. It is. It's the ancient Greeks have a formula. It's called the golden mean for actually mathematically charting out the perfect face. But what's amazing is that almost no faces are the same, even though the measurements are the same. That's because of the fact that each feature is different. Also proportion versus feature. Right, exactly.
Okay, so I'm going to start with all the pastels now. I always like to keep, when I'm working with color, I always like to keep a test piece of paper. For testing out colors before I actually put them on the paper, whether it's paint, whether it's pastels, crayons, anything. Because once you have the color on the image, it's much more difficult to change. So if you know what the color is before you actually apply it to your picture, you're in much better shape. So having some scrap paper nearby, uh, it's kind of a great little security blanket if you're working in color. Liz, could you go over for flesh, the colors, the different ways you can mix the colors? Oh, I know. Wow. So this is a big, big, big subject. And depending on the flesh tone of the person you're looking at, there's a variety of different mixtures you can use. And also the media that you're using. So I'm working with soft pastels now. And the child that I'm looking at has very pale Caucasian skin. So I am starting with a very light white base because with pastels, I know that I can build upon that white. But his skin has a bit of a yellowishy, greenish cast. So I'm going to start more with the yellow green end of the spectrum and then gradually add bits of the opposite primary color, red to bring it to more of a tan, very pale tan color. So think about your color wheel. Remember that there are three primaries. We have red, yellow, and blue. Red, yellow. And blue. When you mix them together, violet, orange, green. And whenever you want to neutralize a color, you mix it with its complementary opposite. So green with red, orange with blue, violet with yellow or all three primary colors together in equal amounts will get you a brown gray neutral color and you can mix that with various amounts of white to create different shades of skin color so we're all just keep in mind we're all different shades of brown. Some of us are lighter, some of us are darker than others. Does that help? And you have to also suspend your belief system and let go of stereotypes. We tend to think of just pink when you say, particularly those of us in one ethnic group, when you say skin color, we think of pink, but 
you know, the range of skin tones is enormous, as we all know. And think about using greens, blues, use colors that you wouldn't ordinarily think of when mixing skin tones. Hope that helps. We have had lessons in mixing skin tone. Um, I will you. try and do another lesson focusing on that in the not too distant future. How's that? Thank you, Liz. You're welcome. And I regret Titian would have been somebody good to do that with. Wish I'd thought of it. So next time. Pastels are one of the few medium though that you can actually mix on the paper. I would not recommend mixing your colors if you're using paint. Don't try and mix the skin tone on your piece of art. You do it on a palette first and then transfer it to the painting. But with pastels, it's a whole different kettle of fish. You kind of have to do it on the image itself. So remember I said there's a kind of greenish cast to his skin, which is not unusual. in Caucasian skin. So I'm adding a tiny bit of very pale green in the shaded parts of his face for starters. And because I laid down that white base first, it's making it even paler. But obviously he is not a green person. So I am gonna counteract that green with something in the red family. Red and green are opposite each other on the color wheel. I'm gonna go for a warm green, not a violet green, a red, a warm red, not a violet red something with a bit more yellow in it because of the kind of yellow greenish tint to his skin. Gonna add it slowly, gradually, and blend. It's a little bit too red, so I'm gonna add a little bit more green. Counteract the red. Yeah, I like that. So this is now more of a brownish shadow.
You can, of course, also just use brown. You can get brown out of the tube or use a brown pencil or crayon. But I think it looks much more realistic if you try and mix your colors. And it's so much fun to experiment and learn about color mixing. So what if it doesn't come out perfectly? You can always change and adapt or rip it up and start all over again. No one has to know. It's all good. We were talking about bread baking earlier, just like Julia Childs, if she screwed up in the batch of bread, she would throw it out and start all over again. It's not the end of the world. I'm not advocating wasting food, but <laughs> you get the gist of what I'm saying.
pencil. While I'm working on the face, I'm using as little line as possible. I'm molding the form of the face with shading. There are a few creases at his smile line. So I'm gonna emphasize those. But for the most part, there's very little line action in his face. Oh gosh, we have about four minutes till sharing. We've accomplished very little today. But I'm not stressed. One of the challenging things with this portrait is going to be the color of his hair with pastels. I'm not sure how I'm going to achieve that.
This is awful to say, but I have no recollection of what color his eyes are. <laughs> hey, Liz. Yes. It's almost 11.45, just time check. Thank you. You're welcome. I'm, I'm aware of that. Thank you. So. Oh, you're welcome. Any help I can get? All right. So thank you, Laura. I'm going to stop. You guys have a minute or two left. I'm going to look up our artist for next week to share with you. So my portrait is starting to emerge. It's still hard to see, unfortunately, but there is a child's face starting to emerge. Right. Keep working, everybody. For one more minute. So I'm going to put our first artist in the chat box, and then we're going to start sharing. Our first artist for May, we have spoken of before, but I don't think we've devoted an entire class to him. The first artist will be Izumu Noguchi, the great Japanese American sculptor and designer. And I think you're going to love his work. And I will be, as always, sending an email out with more information about next Wednesday's class, the first Wednesday in May. Oh, and before we start sharing, um, just a little. Shameless self-promotion. If you have not seen my show and Ibu's show at the Hoboken Historical Museum, these are the last few days. It is closing on Sunday, May 1st. Also, the Hoboken Art and Music Festival is this Sunday. Get out. It looks like it's going to be a beautiful day, and there will be a lot of art to see. My Artists in Transition will be having an art show on the fence outside of the Hoboken Shelter on 3rd between Bloomfield and Garden Street. I'll be there, but not all day. So, sharing time. Who is willing to share? And this is your chance, even if you did not have a good experience today, to share what you've accomplished. And Lizzie, you're first in my queue. That's the first time. There we go. All right. Well, I started a picture. Can you see? Uh, yes. This is my granddaughter. At Whoa! Competition. Look at her, fabulous. And then, <gasps> oh, 
Pretty fantastic. I think I kind of got the motion, but I have a hard time, a harder time getting someone I know's portrait, like the expression or the face, than just a random. As I started out by saying, never do a relative's portrait. Don't take those commissions. It's <laughs> extremely difficult to do the portraits of people we are close to. Because Thanks. it's very difficult to be objective. Mm. Very, very difficult to be objective. But this is a magnificent drawing. Um, the proportions are almost perfect. You want me to? Uh, uh, yeah, I'm still struggling with advice? the hands. <laughs> yeah, the, the head is slightly too big just slightly to fit with the proportion of the body, mm -hmm. you could easily shrink the head by just- Giving her a haircut. <laughs> that and shrinking the oval of the face just a little bit. Mm. Now, Otherwise, she's it's nine hard. years old, so does the proportion- That makes a difference. Mm. I love- Lizzie, listen to me. I love the drawing so much that I would not touch it. Yeah, sometimes then I cause a disaster when I try to go back. Mm. I wouldn't touch it. I don't think you're gonna cause a disaster. I think the integrity and the beauty of the drawing is not worth changing anything for, okay? Oh, but I always offer advice and- No, I appreciate it. That would be the oh, only no, advice. You don't know. <laughs> right. Mm -hmm. It's just gorgeous. Oh, thanks. Uh, you might want to get slightly darker behind your head, too. Uh huh. More of that beautiful shading that you put behind her, her leg that's on the ground. I know. I never, like I always say, I'm going to just do a rough sketch. So this is copy paper because I don't want to waste the good paper. <laughs> then I'm sorry that I didn't put it on a good paper. It doesn't matter what kind of paper it's on. You can always frame it and preserve it under glass or plexi. Mm. And it won't get, it won't deteriorate. Mm. Oh, that's good to know. <laughs> if, if you mount it, make sure they put it on archival paper, archival paper. Mm -hmm. So what does that mean behind it? Right, if you have a mat or a mount, make oh. sure it's archival paper that will preserve it even longer. Oh. All right. Museum quality archival paper. Uh -huh. Awesome, thank you for sharing, Lizzie. Thank you. Keep drawing, the more you do, the easier it becomes. All right, Jane. Hello. So I actually, I wanted to comment on Lizzie's gorgeous drawing. I just, the comment I had was that she captured this youthful, the youthfulness of her yes. granddaughter's body. It was, it's just beautiful. Hmm. Um, I picked something that's a bit challenging and uh, to, a bit too challenging, but I know I'll I'll work with it some more. So I um I chose this image. Mango, beautiful. And uh, it's from uh, yeah, it's from the flamenco festivals um, last week. So it's just really challenging to get um, this. Mm -hmm proportion and foreshorten the like I just yeah. started sketching like foreshortening the upper arm I'm really you know just uh, so yeah. I'm just playing with it it's hard for me to see yeah bring it, can you bring it to next Tuesday's class absolutely yeah it's in my I notebook give you so. more, but it's looking good so far and you yeah it's a gorgeous image I was just captivated by the image but it is challenging. You picked a toughie. I know. Thank you. It looks like you've got a great start. 
So awesome. Thank you for sharing. And Franz May, take it away. Okay. <laughs> so I was inspired by Mary and the whole Annunciation uh, painting. The Annunciation. So, yeah. So I was trying to find like do a strong woman, maybe a modern Mary. And then I chose like a Audrey Hepburn picture. Yes. Wow. And I tried my best to do like a modern Mary. Mary. Wow. But, uh, I always struggle a lot with shading. I really have no idea what I'm doing most of the time. So yeah, I, I thought it would be easier because the picture is black and white. So it would help me with, with the shading. The yes. But I know I still have a long way to. <laughs> yes, keep working on it. It's a very dramatic portrait. I like the way you're going from dark to light gradually, particularly around the star shaped earring. That's very beautiful the way you're modeling the face. And when you've done more of that, don't be afraid to get darker, particularly under the chin area and in the background around the halo to make that halo really glow you can make it much darker around the edges of that okay. modern mary hmm. she's very elegant yeah. thanks franz may oh, thank this you. is so exciting how everybody interprets differently thank you so much dina you're up Okay, so I've started drawing something and it's not quite where I want it to be because I started four times, but I'll bring it next Tuesday. Oh, okay. Look at this beautiful image though that you have up. Hi. Thank Where, you. Where's the camera? This one's mine. Here's Lauren. I, I don't know if you can see it. Uh, Lauren, I... we can't see it unless you get rid of your background thingy. Okay, here we go. Background. None. All right, this is, you got it? Got it. Yes. You can turn this, can you see the image at all? Yes, yes. So it's the beginnings, like she said, it's just the beginnings of something, but it's a man running. I'm working on the foreshortening of the hands and the yes. proportioning, but I'm also starting to really look at the figure. Um, so I'm trying to learn how to do musculature this is a fine specimen here, obviously. <laughs> um, but yeah, so I'm, I'm just gonna, he doesn't have a shirt on. So this is all going to be muscle, muscle, muscle. So just working on it. It's coming along brilliantly. I would recommend look at the forearm. Here? Yeah, I would here. check out the picture more in the forearm. Th there has to be some more muscle here. Oh, there's- from, there's From the elbow to the wrist. I'm guessing there's more muscle. Yes, and, there's, there's a lot of shading. Okay, yeah. So once you've got that shading in place, it's, yeah, it's gonna look I'll, fuller. I'll work and then on, my um, only other question is, are the hands maybe a little bigger? The hands are definitely a little bigger. I just, this is um, kind of cupping a water bottle it, with a straw. Oh, a water bottle, I thought maybe so, a donut. It's kind of just at the top here, and this one, it's kind of like coming back. Yeah. So um, it's harder to see. So when I, I think, probably like maybe an eighth of an inch, or within that, a sixteenth, um, I'll be making it a little bit bigger. So I can't wait to see of, keep working. Love thank it. Thank you. Love yeah, it. I'll uh, I'll send you a picture. <laughs> I want to meet the model. Uh, you and me both. <laughs> Get his number for me, okay? <laughs> but I, I'll, I'll keep working on it and I'll send you a picture of the before, the cool. before and after. Yes, please. Awesome. And we welcome home, kid. Oh, thank you. Thank you. I've, I've been, been missing you guys. So <laughs> good to be here. Missing you big time. Keep drawing. Yes, ma'am. All right, Esty, you're next. Thanks. Thank you to you both, Dina and Lauren. 
SD. I did the artist, oh. artist of the day. You did the real Dana, da Dana, however it's pronounced. This one, but you know. Oh, you did Olympia? Did you, you're looking at Manet's Olympia? No, not Manet's. It's oh. the Titian then. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Okay, it can be Matisse or anybody else. You know, I Gorgeous. This is wow. so cool, SD. Yeah. And the okay. fact that you did collage, wow, that took a lot of chutzpah. Yeah, lot of it was the easiest thing to do for me. <laughs> it's yeah. beautiful. Thanks. The colors, the composition, love it. Gracias. Thanks. De nada. Okay, well done. Heather, thanks for sharing, SD. Oh, wow. I did the gestural. Speaking of Matisse, love it. Love, love, love it. I would emphasize this curve somehow, darken the edge maybe. Mm -hmm. So gorgeous. Love this. <sighs> Thanks, Heather. Yeah. Oh, you're getting hearts. There are in the reaction things. You're getting yeah. hearts, Heather. Thanks for sharing. Suzanne, we saved you till the end. I'm still working on it. I I did a dig out. Oh, oh, Dega. The bathers. Am I right? It looks like a Dega yes. or a Renoir even. Yes, it's a Dega. Um, I don't know if I got the proportions right though. Liz. I don't care. I like the emotion of it. Love, I love the feeling you've captured. Very nice. Beautiful shading. Beautiful. Yeah, that I mean there are some proportional distortions, but I don't care. It doesn't bother you? Okay. Not at all. Okay. It's weird. Sometimes you can get away with it and sometimes you can't. <laughs> I don't think you should think one more minute about proportions. It's perfect. Just, I want to see it when it's finished. Okay. Well done. It is 12.01. How good at, are we at timing? I want to congratulate everyone. I, have I missed anyone who wants to share? Let me just scroll through quickly. We had, I believe we had like 15, 20 people at the beginning. Kudos yes. to all of you for mm -hmm. sticking through till the end for sharing. I'm hoping that the sharing comment time really helps you. Bravo, bravo, bravo. Thank and you, Liz. I will, I will see you next week for Isamu Noguchi, one of my all time favorite artists. And you should talk to Heidi about doing a culture club visit to his museum. I would go. I have never been there. I've heard it's spectacular. All right. Have a great week, everyone. Bye. Have a great week, everyone. You too. Bye, and everybody. I don't know about you. I will be delighted to see April behind us. Oh. <laughs> Thank, yes. you, Liz. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Liz. Now, everybody. Thanks, guys. Bye. Thanks.